If you follow my Instagram timeline, now, I don't recommend it personally, but you're allowed to do whatever the hell you want, you may have noticed I've been into GECs in 2020. It started out with switchblades, and uh, then throughout the year, as my brain began to rot, now we're buying knives made for, I guess, the sorts of dudes wearing traditional adventurer clothing, whilst sitting at their computer chair, who spend three hours a day ranting about synthetic fabrics and chivalry on the internet forums. Occasionally, they'll venture out to take a picture of a knife on the porch, yell at the squirrels and their bird feeder. But getting back to my problem for the course of the video, and to be honest, or TBH, I don't know if it's some sort of coping mechanism with the year in general, or a yin to the tactical lifestyle's yang as to what's going on with me and the old guy knives. But with a little help, I decided to make a video about the passion, the frustration, the classy vests, the hot dog shields, the death wishes, and the heartbreak of trying to buy a great eastern cutlery, not just in 2020, but anytime. Or at least, you know, buying the one you really like. Then afterwards, I'll talk at length about my current GEC collection, as you try to ease out the door, along with fellow internet knife guy Alex from The Alex Knife Box. Now, if you're not familiar, Great Eastern Cutlery is one of the remaining holdouts of a USA-produced traditional-style knife, other than the stainless steel Levin case. Uh, okay, and... God, some bucks. I know at least two assholes from the Buckmaster race were halfway through a condescending comment below. I get it. But at the Great Eastern Cutlery, traditional knives are literally all they make. Just old-fashioned, corn-fed, salt-of-the-earth, carbon steel knives, most of which don't lock, and in uh, small rotating batches that can be frustratingly hard to buy, especially if you'd like to devote any of your free thought to anything else. Okay, let's dig into GEC a bit more as we peruse their website. Is this your idea of fun, watching a guy recording himself surfing the internet? GEC makes traditional folding knives and fixed blades in a series of patterns. If you count here, on the pattern page, I counted, uh, maybe incorrectly, 66. And in each pattern, there's any number of blade and handle material variations. And these patterns are produced in small batches on a rotating basis, ensuring the only place you can get them are when shitheads flip them on eBay or via forum posts. That also means your favorite pattern may have been only produced a few times or once over the years in the variation you like. GEC also produces knives for other companies under different brand names and also retailer exclusives called SFOs. SFO stands for Special Factory Orders, which are the harder to get ones, especially when the handle material is bone and you have a goddamn life. There's a super hard to find Schrade Switchblade GEC made a few years back. Would like to find one of those at a reasonable price. Then there is a Blue Bone 23 made for a tiny official retailer called Cutlery Classics. Those 23s are letting their resale value age in a drawer somewhere now. So how do you buy or keep track of the Great Eastern Cutlery you really want without sacrificing interpersonal relationships or spending all day F5ing product pages from 15 different retailers or maybe reading page after page of men with wives posting pictures of their number 35s on the Blade forums I guess there's also watching your email inbox for in-stock alerts, like you never want to feel the warm touch of another human again. Well, the truth is you have to do all those things. It sucks buying a GEC because it seems like they always make too many of the knives that no one wants and too little of the knives homely men in hats might want to turn tricks for. It's a very precise business model. Anyway, we're here for my method, right? It's simple, and it'll guarantee you'll never have someone look at you like they want to have sex again. So first, you go to GEC's list of authorized retailers. Add those to a bookmark folder, or more appropriately, just add an individual link to your desktop for each retailer next to the link for your Yahoo inbox. Then check and see if any of those have in-stock alerts on those websites. And if they do, sign up for them. That way your email's floating around at a few more places. Okay, then you need to get the pulse of when GEC starts releasing them. Really plug into the community. Well, hello, fellow Pocket Watch collectors. How do you do? I normally can get a sense by visiting GEC's production blog page, and then I head over to Bladeform's traditional knives and folder section and read threads from patterns on the first page or two. There's always someone that's like, while a gentleman never reveals his sources, let's just say the last name was Howard of the person I talked to. <laughs> and then it turns out the information is still wrong. But anyway, what you really need to find out is, what excites that guy who uses the word fiancé in every post? What does he look for? And then what you have to do is wait and, uh, you know, I guess pretend like you're looking at Facebook political memes or internet porn so no one can tell. And then be prepared to be disappointed. 
you will miss out on maybe 10 for every one you get. Except for the 97, there will always be a 97 somewhere. Collector's Knives is a good one, especially because you can pre-order one. But of course you'll have to download another fucking app for that and follow their instructions on how to set it up. So there's always a catch. That's not really a knock on Collector's Knives. That's just uh, where we are for collecting GECs. So, let's delve into the brand divisions. Now from GEC, you'll see Tuddy Oat. I'm not from the area, okay? Northfield, and uh, then Farm and Field Tool. Great Eastern Cutlery also makes some of the knives for Northwoods, which is a brand name owned by Knives Ship Free and only sold there. And there's uh, Mayer and Grosch. They have a website, kind of a weird name, but whatever. Then uh, Way North, do they have a website? I'm sure they do, I don't know. And sometimes GEC makes limited editions for larger brands and some boutique brands. My brain literally has no more room for GEC lore and all of the different retailers and brands they have to make knives for, or have made knives for. Word is GEC is not going to produce knives for special factory orders or other companies per a fall 2020 policy that no one can agree on if they're sticking to or not. Yeah, I've read the threads. Occasionally I get comments saying, why do you make fun of the people you're trying to make videos for? Well, those people are me, okay? Okay, let's look at some of the knives I own. GEC generally comes in tubes wrapped in wax paper, like uh, inside of... The knife comes wrapped in wax paper, not the tube. They have unique stickers on the tubes and sometimes come with a real fun button inside or maybe something else, a sticker. It's like an adult toy. And the Northwoods come with real cool worthless coins. While Great Eastern Cutlery does make some stainless steel models, many of their knives use carbon steel that can rust and will darken over time. So lube regularly and wipe moisture off your blade before folding it and putting it back in your pants. And then it falls to the bottom of your pocket with that half dollar and a peppermint. First, the 97. Does everyone hate the 97? Is it too big? You can still get these in a lot of places. I bought mine used for 90 bucks, but you can find it for about $115. I got mine in wild Irish rose with a delightful yellow bone handle. Sorry, they're called covers. Regular knives call them scales when they're on top of liners. Traditional knives, they call those covers. Covers. They're called covers. Covers. They're called covers. This is really a fine knife with a great sound when it snaps close, which is one of the most important features of a traditional pocket knife. Was the production run on these too big? I don't know. Sometimes it's a waste of time trying to figure out why a particular knife, uh, is there a polite way to say it, is unfuckable? If, if there's a way to say it, please post in the comments below. This is from the 2019 run. I think the tip is ground a little too thick, so it might take a while to reprofile versus the rest of the edge. One of the things I like here is the yellow rose shield. Now, uh, let me show you. Here's a handy shield chart from GEC's website. Now, not all of the 97s have the rose, and that's just, you know, another one of those little details guys on the forums love about the knives, the fun shields. For example, when they ramp up production on a particular pattern, they'll have different shields, blades, and different handle covers. So when they run a 97, they'll run it in four or five different trims with different names or shields on them. Sometimes different blade uh, configurations too, even within the same run. And they'll be run every few years, so it's unlikely for the current run to reproduce the handle covers, the blade type and quantity, and shield. So it'll give each run a uniqueness. You know, in each one of those four or five different variations on the same pattern, we'll have a few hundred released of each. They post their production runs on their website, so uh, here it is for the 97 pattern in 2019. Does any other manufacturer do this? I don't think so. Now how about the beer and sausage tool, a 2020 pattern, which is based on the 35, if I remember correctly. I paid about 125 new for this one from GP Knives. And in it you have everything the bearded beer bro personality type needs. The comb, the fork, the bottle opener, and uh, that other part. For drinking some micro brews, stabbing some sausages, grooming at the dinner table, opening your beers. Speaking of stabbing sausages, uh, aren't you at that age where you should be considering those yearly inspections. Are they yearly? And uh, what, what age again? I don't know. Remember, if you don't get tested, you don't have it. I've learned that this year. The canvas micarta is nice, and I noticed it faded a little when it got wet, which is fine because part of the appeal of traditional knives is how they wear, patina, and take on your own personal filth signature. The other part of the appeal is buying more than you can ever use and then locking them away in a drawer and occasionally pulling them out to take pictures of for your forum buddies. A few other observations. I've noticed the comb kind of rubs. There's some rub marks on it. Not a big deal. Kind of like it. 
Oh, yeah, the comb. Sorry, I've read the comments about how combs on knives are gross. That's entirely true. I only use my knife's blade for sterile food prep, so the comb is definitely the dirtiest part of the knife. For example, I've never scraped some old paint from a windowsill, put it away without cleaning it, and then used it to cut vegetables a few hours later. Never happened. This is the 2020 release. I think it's uh, the first of its kind. I don't think they've made one of these before. And I heard a rumor that 1200 were made, so make sure you treat my eighth hand information as fact, like everyone else does on the internet. And the Northwoods Indian River Jack. Yay, I got one, which cost about $189 Ugh, from Knives Ship Free. Remember, they own the brand name Northwoods. This is also based upon the 35 pattern. You can see it next to the other one here. It's thinner than the beer and sausage tool, and the blade is a little bland looking. I like those Northwoods ones with the word Northwoods on the, the top of the blade, like near the spine. I like the logo up there. I've, I've seen some, but I can't afford uh, what people are charging for those ones. These were available for a total of about six minutes, and there were a hundred made of each of the bone styles, which is uh, kudu, giraffe, mammoth, and camel. Then there was the Makarta version. I think about a hundred of each, so there's maybe, I don't know, five, six hundred. Many are showing up now on eBay for three to five fifty. In fact, there was this one the day of that was listed for four hundred and eighty that got taken down. Ooh, not a good look. The mammoth bone were the most expensive at two hundred and twenty dollars, I believe. So when you buy a mammoth in the future, know that that's how much they used to cost. So you can hold a grudge. Very nice though. Nowhere near worth the insane eBay prices that they're charging now. A few weeks later, how about the thirty-six? I think it's called the toenail. Hmm, that sounds good or the sunfish, or the whaler, I don't know. It's a large knife with a large blade, and I don't know what they cost new. I received this one in a trade a few years ago. Someone had reground the blade. It wasn't super pretty, which is probably why it was traded to me. But these go for about three, four hundred bucks an hour, sometimes. This particular version wouldn't, of course, which is uh, according to the date stamp made back in 2008. And uh, while we're at it, here's GEC's handy chart telling you what the stamp means. Most importantly, you can tell the year and the pattern. Real fun stuff, guys. Another fun fact. You can't on the uh, Northwoods. They don't have a date stamp on them. Okay, how about some 23s? Both are a 2020 release. Well, ladies, I think I'll own about nine GECs by the end of the year. And by and large, when I compare these 23s to those other ones and all of my other slip joints, these are the hardest pull and the hardest snap close of my other knives. Very similar to the Boker Slack. Now you'll need strong fingernails to pull it. Hopefully you've been taking your alpha nail supplements. <laughs> oh boy, I was proud of that one. It seems to be characteristic of the 23s in general, even older runs if internet bros are to be believed. And they always are, aren't they? I have a single blade with a liner lock that costs about $90 and a double blade which was about $125. The single blade few observations here. While it has a lock, it's best to think of it as a standard slip joint with a safety. It has the same pull and half stop as a double blade, but much harder to close. You'll definitely need two hands to close it. The Woodland Micarta is a really nice to look at and has a great hand feel without being too aggressive. The double blade is a hard pull on both two. The secondary blade looks like it dings on the peak of the back spring when it snaps closed, which is why it's always preferable to ease the blades closed. But then how are you going to talk about the talk with your internet buddies? There's actually a term that refers to that blade ding, but I forget what it's called, and I will shoot myself if I ever remember. The 21 or Bull Buster, which is a classic sod buster pattern. We're going to look at that one now. I did a video on this a while back that featured a batoning accident. This one set me back about 65 bucks. I think I got this from Collector's Knives. A nice large knife. It's light and fun with its polished Micarta handles. This one is a 2019 release, you know. The cool thing about Micarta is it comes in a lot of varieties. The sausage and beer tool is a little uh, more fabric-y feeling, and this one's a smooth. It's a 2019 release. I think I prefer it to the 23, even though it's a similar size. I like that the pull is not as hard as on the 23. I think that's the reason. So watch my video film for more details. Now how about another Northwoods? Eugene sold this to me for a reasonable 140 bucks, and I don't remember what year it is, but... It's a Madison Barlow in Appaloosa Bone, and Eugene is a good guy, so go watch his channel. Remember, Northwoods is a brand owned by website Knives Ship Free. I think I've said that three times now. For several years, GEC has made their folders for them. You know, manufacturers can change, of course, and I believe somebody else makes the Northwoods fixed blades. But, as always, 
Northwoods are released maybe once a year, once every two or three years, and they're not released that often. The patterns rotate as well, and none of them seem to have quite the same handle look. This one is a perfect size, has a beautiful handle, and the blade patina is nice. That was uh, mostly Eugene, though. I think this is my favorite Great Eastern colorway yet. All right, do you have time for the 74, which is beloved by the twitchy F5ers everywhere? This isn't from the newest release that was denoted by its trademark, low production run and high demand. Uh, Mr. Howard, do you think we should make a little more since it's uh, so popular? Make them suffer. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not a large knife in the hand, not too small either. I prefer the larger Madison Barlow. Translated into modern knives, a good utility size for me that combines a larger blade and a nice grip is the paramilitary too. It's not the best knife for all occasions, and sometimes it's nice to have a smaller one, but, you know, that's just my preference. The shield resembles something you might find in the middle of a sidewalk, on a nice walk, on a warm fall day. Or the keyhole, as it's officially called, because the bristle would have been a little too obvious. The knife is very light at two and a third ounces, and Dave from the Knife Nuts gave me this knife because, you know, it really wasn't his thing. And this is a real true story that happened in 2020, by the way. I guess the universe has a way for making up for my household not getting that stimulus check after all. But the silver lining is the IRS assured me it'd be on my taxes next year. I assume this knife is so popular because of its neutral grip, it's not too big, not too small size, and classic looks. Last but not least of my collection, the only other GEC I own, and one I just got a few days ago. It's exciting times around these parts. My wife and kids were so happy that I scored one. Dad, you're amazing. I don't need all those toys for Christmas. Enjoy some self-care. That's how my kids talk. The good thing about the little rattlers, or the 19, is that they're still available, and very tiny. The pull isn't super strong, maybe like the 97. Not weak, but not strong. It's one and three quarters cutting edge, I'm sure is good for letter opening, among other fun office things. I wish the blue teal bone was a little lighter, like in color, so it showed a little more character. And I've seen some lighter variants, like on uh, GP knives. Pocket knives this small usually aren't my thing, but I bought it because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to in the future. And that's why most GECs are sold. Cost me about 78 bucks from collector's knives, so when you look at other retailers and see it going for 110 or whatever, know that you're helping someone who needs that extra revenue more than collector's knives does in 2020. Merry Christmas, everyone. I use the Telegram app, described earlier in the video for the early reserve, it sends you an alert faster than their website emails you when things are available for early reserve. You log in with the Telegram link, reserve one, then when it comes in you buy it. Thing is you have to be fast on the Telegram link because the early reserves fill up in like minutes. Two minutes, you're too late, but you probably got to enjoy life just a little bit more. Okay, so it's hard to explain why a person would like a traditional knife. Two-handed opening, no pocket clip, no lock. You know, while you have to tough two of those things out, you can always get a clip slip for the pocket clip thing. It keeps the knife in the top of your pocket and protects it. Now the hard candy residue may be part of the charm to some fellows, and that's fine. Just let the knife fall to the bottom of those pre-washed faded glories. Okay, you know what? Traditional knives are like playing records when you can just Spotify easier. No year-end list to share on your social media feed. I'm kind of scratchy, but you like the extra steps you have to take to make it work. I did a video on the clip slip if you're interested in hearing more of my talking. Well, now that you've heard me ramble for 20 minutes, let's talk to Alex. Alex, let's discuss some of your favorites. Do we have any overlaps? Have we accidentally stolen knives out of each other's carts? Wow, that is one snazzy-ass logo. I mean, it's not a blue line, but it'll work. Some major advance pointers from a bro of advanced knifeness. I mean, look at this guy. He wears a machete around town probably knows knives pretty damn well. After all, both him and I are here to supply you with an endless amount of invaluable information for you to rot your brain on. Or better yet, influence you on spending that sweet rent money on a sweet new knife, which you really need, trust me. It was the last one in store. Okay, let's talk about Great Eastern Cutlery Knives. We're all familiar with our daily routines. Grab your favorite clothes, get yourself ready for the day to kick the day's ass, 
Pick your favorite piece of EDC gear. Spend 20 to 30 minutes looking for which knife you're going to wear today. Flick a few of them around, take them out. Angle them, which one's going to look best on your page. But for all intensive purposes today, we're going to grab some Great Eastern Cutlery Made Slip Joints. Now I have to disclose, I don't do this style of review very often, or hardly at all. But for today, I wanted to show you guys that there should be no fear of carrying around and using a slip joint or a non-locking knife, period. I've found them to be very handy and very capable, a lot more capable than people are under the impression of. First things first, the blade steel on these is 1095 carbon steel. And I gotta admit, I've always had a special place in my heart for 1095 carbon steel. It sharpens very easily. It comes back to life with a strop. It tends to hold an edge quite well. It's just an easy, very manageable steel all around for me. Now it is very inexpensive, and I know today we have some high speed grade steels that perform extremely well. Um, but this honestly is just fine for me. I don't think I would have a problem owning a 1095 steel blade for the rest of my life. As you can see, the non-locking thing doesn't seem to be a bit of an issue either. Now I am doing things, well, something I'm known for, which is doing things with a knife that you shouldn't be doing with a knife. Like getting a bigger stick to hammer it through. But in all intensive purposes, don't try this at home. And yes, I processed all of that using that little tiny slip joint. I even chopped the tree down with a slip joint. If you don't believe me, remember, this is the internet. Okay, let's start off with this 2020 Collector Knives Edition Beer and Sausage Knife. Thanks, Mike. Just the name alone screams of hairy, sweaty manliness seeping through your pores. The beer and sausage knife, as the name ever so cleverly implies, is the ultimate man's knife. So you can sculpt your sausage into an upside down umbrella. The beer and sausage also cleverly equipped with a hybrid beer opener sausage spork. Oh wait, it's flat. So it's not a spork, it's a beer opening fork or a bork. Or is it a fear opener? I sometimes ponder on these things while enjoying my breakfast of champions. The important thing is, is that it works, and it's clever. The knife is compact, yet retaining three of the most important tools known to man. And as a man, getting ready in the morning is an important chore. From shaving your face, to delicately slicing your breakfast sausage, to combing your beard and cracking a brew. This all-in-one, messy, compact pocket tool is a must for everyone's knife collection. The blade is sleek and attractive. Plenty of cutting power for an inner city slicker like myself to open envelopes and other difficult tasks I find myself useless accomplishing without a knife. The spork, or bork, as you saw, is pretty useful as well, although I probably lost $50 of resale value making this video. The beard comb, or BRT, is that beer wrangling tool? No, that's a W. Anyways, I figured I'd demonstrate the use of this tool on my head before you decided to. I recommend you don't try this at home, as you might end up with a bleeding scalp. It is designed for your beard. Overall, it's not something that is part of my day-to-day, -day, but I appreciate the novelty of the whole thing. Hell, I'm surprised the Vikings didn't invent the beard comb. I don't know, just a food for thought. Next up is a knife I think is very suitable for those that require a locking knife. Let's take a look at this traditional pattern 23, or as I like to call it, the big ass trapper. 
Now this one features some gorgeous Brazilian wood scales, but you can see the liner lock tab protrudes ever so slightly but not past the blade, which is a real nice aesthetic touch. The back spring unfortunately is a 10 out of 10 and the fact that there's a nail nick in this blade to me is kind of hilarious. The rest of the knife overall the fit and finish and the liner lockup is very secure and the finish is very nice. Although the back spring is so strong that it makes it a little bit frightening to close at times. But overall as a workhorse and a knife very comfortable to use and carry and have in the pocket i think the trapper pattern 23 is a viable option next up we have the oil field jack or the 86 it features an attractive clip point reminiscence of a bowie knife or is it buoy paired up with this clip point is an attractive Warncliffe blade I'm generally not a fan of a double bladed jackknife, but in this instant, I gotta admit, I like it. As a matter of fact, I like it so much, I bought an acrylic tortoise shell version. Something I saw on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks, Bob. This is a perfect example of the same manufacturer and the same pattern, but a different brand and different features. Collect them all. Next up, we have my favorite release this year, the Mustang, or the Pattern 74. I managed to snag this one from Knife Ship Free. Before the buy it and resell it for 300% profit crowd got it. The pull is about a 5 out of 10. It's very easy to open and close. The blade is a simple yet attractive drop point in a high polish featuring an extremely thin blade stock. The handle features an elegant bolster, followed up by a flared out stag handle. Now these actually come in materials like micarta and others, which make it a bit of a slimmer carry. But I like the feel and the grip of the flared stag handles on this one. Overall, I find the Mustang an attractive carry and simply one of my favorites. Next, let's look at this Harrison Bay in this attractive denim micarta while we talk a little more about Northwood's knives. Also manufactured by Great Eastern Cutlery. I find these to be the highest qualities for GECs. Details like the engraved name logo, the forced patina flats, the flush shield, and the pins, the clean bolster cuts, and the premium micarta or other materials that these come in make these the premium great eastern cutlery knife the gucci of the gecs if you will this tends to be a little bit of a small knife for my usual size but honestly i do like it it does cut well and it also makes a really nice office carry the harrison bay is a really awesome little knife Last, let's talk about my favorite GEC knife, the Madison Barlow. Also branded under the Northwoods logo, these have become really tough to find and very sought after. Some feature two blades, but mine has one, generally the way I prefer my jackknives. The blade is 3.5 inches of high polished 1095 steel. Now the front swedge that is so pronounced is one of my favorite highlights of this knife. This one also features a long pull rather than having a nail nick, which is something I also prefer in slip joints. Making this easily the top GC on my list. This knife is also very easy to open and close, and because of its size I find it easy to close one handed. It's fun to carry, it's attractive, and also features those beautiful amber bone handles. Now let's not also forget about that handsome arrow shield bolster, which comes in high polish and it's fitted up very, very nicely. Passed up with the amber bone, I think this is a lovely combination overall.
Now I know I can hear some of you guys grumbling through the screen that slip joints don't have pocket clips, but there are solutions out there, guys, just saying. Anyways, established in the mid-2000s, GECs have the look and feel of something made over a hundred years ago. So we talked GECs for a while, but if that's too traditional for you, there are more modern options out there, like this XM18 Slippy with a pocket clip, forward finger choil, and thumb studs. Or let's take this line steel thrill for example, M390 blade, integral titanium slip joint, and even a spring-loaded pocket clip that resets back into the handle. I mean, that's pretty cool. The newest fad, the double detent slip joint. Now I will admit guys, I enjoy flicking the bean just like the next guy. There's something interesting in the knife world they call fidgetability. Or is it fidget factor? Anyways, whatever it is, it sounds like something I would go blind doing. The double detent system allows the user to pop their knives open with pressure and pop them closed. Unfortunately, this is not a skill that I myself have acquired and are able to demonstrate for you. Finally, there's the custom slip joint. This South African example is from custom knife maker Andre de Vie, featuring Mokime and Rosewood. The fact that it's imported and that it's limited makes it cost a lot more. Now, if you're into customs, you can go much higher, like thousands of dollars higher. But my whole idea with this was just to show you that the slip joint world may be a little bit bigger than you thought. Anyways, I've rambled on enough. Let's get back to my favorite, the Advanced Knife Bro. All right, so thanks to Alex for joining me and sharing his insight into the GEC. You have been taking a drink every time I've said GEC, right? These knives generally cost about $60 to $220 depending on the materials used and what brand they're listed under. Most average about 100 bucks though. For an American-made collector's knives, they're a great value. Part of the reason GECs are so sought after is the way they rarely make the same looking knife twice. Their rotating small batch production runs and the way they pit you against other collectors. And they're made wholly in the USA. In fact, there's a video online that shows exactly how they make all their knives, which is pretty cool. I'll link that below too. As far as comparisons, case knives are sometimes cheaper, but have more of inconsistent quality control. I don't own any Rough Riders, but uh, you do, and you seem to really love them, so you have really good taste. Here I have a Benchmade Proper, which while an admirable knife visually, let's use a comparison. Benchmade treats a crisp backspring the way it handles blade centering. That means the backspring is mushy and sucks. Not light or an easy pull, just mushy. It's not like it's a really light but nice pull, just a mushy pull. It's like a friction folder, at least mine is. Two good but a bit more expensive entries I have in old guy style knives are the Lion Steel Shuffler, which gave uh, quite a bit of variety in blade and cover options, and then the Falcon from HEA Designs. Both feature slightly better fitment over some of the GECs, but not by a lot. You you know, less likely to have a part rub here or there like you would on a GEC. But strictly speaking for GECs, they typically hold their value a little better and appreciate in price. The shufflers I don't think really grow in value. However, the fandom around a Great Eastern Cutlery and how connected you need to be in the GEC forum and social media and in-stock email alert based lifestyle to buy the one you want is about as fun as slamming your head into a hard surface repeatedly. But let's say repeatedly banging your head into the desk is your fetish. Yeah, it's kind of hard to explain to other people, isn't it? Which brings up another point. Don't we call them kinks nowadays? Fetish is probably what old nudists say. However, the people who flip those knives for insane amounts and drive up the prices are excellent capitalists, but they are also assholes and, if you think about it, in a weird way, romantic partners. Mutual masturbators, if you will. And you know what? I'm sorry this is the only channel willing to say that. I don't know what the happy medium is for collecting knives, but uh, you should still be able to buy a knife a few hours or a few days after a retailer lists them as available. Of course, that means uh, retailers will have more stock on hand, and they like to sell their knives, so I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a businessman. Anyway, if you like this sort of video, and you probably don't by now, it's a bit better of an idea to subscribe to Alex. He's the normal one. A great dude with an impressive knife collection. 
my collection, Uncomfortable Knife Bros collection, sucks. Follow him on Instagram as well. The link is in the description. Patreon me if you deem me worthy of your knife money, even if I only put out a video or two a month. Think about it this way. I'm barely even the tax on a knife. And these people here all love doing it because they're smart and really handsome. T-shirts, mugs, and stickers are available for super fans too. Like, subscribe, comment. Thanks for watching.